नमस्ते थैंक यू सो मच सो वेलकम आलोक द गुड टू सी यू some of you will all be, already know alok da is very very familiar in the mother shri arbindo circles uh to describe him i would say he would like it that he is simply a child and a beautiful child of the mother like that's the most valid description i can say apart from that uh, alok da is a uh, psychiatrist and he is living in pondicherry at shri arbindo ashram and uh, he has uh, worked with the indian air force and most of you would be familiar with the youtube uh, channel he has aroma and he illuminates us with his beautiful talks so without uh, taking much of everybody's time i welcome alok da to sh- talk to us on integral yoga thank you so much alok da over to you namaste to be called upon to speak about integral yoga is like asking someone describe the ocean and the himalayas and the earth and the solar system and the creation and beyond <laughs> by the very term integral it means it is an all inclusive yoga meaning thereby that traditionally yogas all kinds of yoga pick up one part or aspect of a being and through a process of concentration they find a little gap in our nature through which this part starts moving towards what we call as the divine the source the essence the truth call it whatever and this union whatever be the means of contact gives the same impression the, the contact part but depending on what is our initial conception about the divine it gets because divine is infinite he has many aspects it gets conditioned by that so it's very important in integral yoga to understand that unlike yogas where we unite one part or the other with the divine in integral yoga it is every aspect every part every movement and if possible eventually every moment one has to be united with the divine but for this very reason it is important to have the right concept of the divine because mind is the initial scaffolding through which we go and while it is true that the divine is beyond all conceptions we should never forget that we should never try to bind the divine into any conception format formula dogma creed anything by doing it we limit not only the divine but our own journey and our own experience of the divine yet because to start with one cannot uh, deal with abstractions the mind when it doesn't have a very clear form or an experience it tends to turn things into a kind of abstraction once you have the experience then the divine is much more real in fact the only real <laughs> and all this universe <laughs> but to start the journey it is good to have a very clear idea of the divine which is consonant with what we are seeking so one idea of the divine is which uh, we know is prevalent is that this world is an illusion jagat mithya brahma satya the divine is true and if that be the originating idea to through which we move and towards which we move then the experience of the divine will be such that we will miss his meaning and purpose in the world because if the world is illusion it's a waste of course illusion can be understood in two ways one is that it's a distortion which is true the other is it's a non existent reality which has somehow come into being and seems very real if we take that approach then it creates endless metaphysical complexities but i am not going into that so the integral idea of the divine is that the world and god however different and seemingly apart they may seem and it is so to our seeming yet in their essence are one world is nothing else but an extension of god in time and space through form and name the cre- creation is a act of the creator so that he can manifest himself 
So once we have this conception that creation is a means of manifesting the creator, it's like an artist who paints or who writes a book. If you ask Vyasa, what are you writing? He would say, I am writing what is within me. I am expressing through these words, through this poem, through these characters. All these characters are within me. And I am expressing them through this wonderful, longest epic known in human history. And then you ask him, tell me the essence of this story. He will say, it's the epic of the soul. You call it Mahabharata. To me, it is the epic of the soul, of man's ascension towards the divine. So similarly, the divine is writing or in, through creation, he is manifesting himself. If this be so, then the goal of yoga will not be annulment in the divine, nirvana, salvation, into the beyond, or any such like, which is the popular notion of the purpose of yoga, but becoming more and more fit and capable to manifest the divine in the way we should manifest. Even now, all creation is a manifestation of the divine, but it is partial, it is distorted. Why it gets distorted? Because our instruments, our personality, our very consciousness is not ready to receive the divine impulsion rightly and to express it. The instruments are very limited. Even if by some means the inner consciousness gets liberated and is able to even fuse, unite with the divine, yet the instruments are not ready. They cannot express. So we are in the position of a person, someone, who knows that there is wonderful music in the heart of Shiva. And even though at times he has a glimpse of Shiva, he cannot fathom that music. And if he fathoms it, it's a momentary wonder. He cannot express it in his speech or through the instruments that he has at its disposal. That doesn't serve the purpose of this yoga at least, because in this yoga, it is not done for any individual experience or realization alone but it is done for the earth. Meaning thereby, the earth is engaged in a kind of yoga. We don't know it. We call it just it's moving, seasons are changing, evolution is happening. But evolution is through this yoga which is going on within earth. So who is doing the yoga in earth? It is the divine who is hidden inside. Just as we have a soul hidden inside, the earth has a soul. And that soul is struggling to emerge through all the various challenges and difficulties and possibilities. So when human beings come, their real purpose is to participate in this ongoing yoga. So we sign in for a program when we say that we are engaged in yoga. Basically we are signing in for a program that is already going on. It's an ongoing program of creation. And when we sign it, we fall in that line. But when we sign in for a program, we must know what that program is about, what are the ifs, buts, do's, don'ts, if any, and then we move through that process. This is the background. But before signing in, who is ready to sign into this program? Is it possible that I read a book and can do this yoga? Is it possible that I come in contact with somebody and can start taking up this yoga? Well, um, reading a book, meeting people, can be a preparation for the yoga, but it's not yoga itself. Yoga starts only when we have a call for the divine. We may live in Pondicherry incidentally and yet not have the call for the yoga. Call for the yoga means that this is the reason of our life. If somebody wakes us up and asks, what do you want to do in life? So it, it won't be like, you know, by the way, I am also doing yoga. I like this yoga. Oh, this is so wonderful. There should be call for the yoga. This is important because any yoga, though, you know, now there is a popular conception of the yoga, that yoga is very easy. You just learn some practices and techniques like a feel-good factor. But yoga, no yoga is easy because it's revolting against your entire nature. Nature binds us through 101 bonds. It doesn't allow yoga. It only allows that much of release in a single lifetime as it is already prefixed. So it doesn't allow human beings to engage in yoga. What about the world? It doesn't allow at all. As the mother says, you breathe poison in the world. That's why there are spaces created to uh, you know, become conducive to the process of yoga. So it's important to have the call because when we have the call, 
then we will go through the rigors of the journey of yoga we'll endure the long passage we'll continue to persevere without any uh, disheartening or frustrating feeling that comes in some people who have started on the journey of yoga thinking that well i do some nice meditation and i feel very good so if somebody were to come to shirbinder and the mother and there have been people instances like that and said that well i can meditate for hours am i fit for this yoga that's not the criteria shubindu would not accept do you have the call for yoga that's the important thing call itself is initiation what does it mean it means this that this is what i believe i am born to do i am meant to do this is the most important one factor which summarizes the entire process of initiation and once we do this see we have the call we have to keep confirming it there will be many calls from different directions there will be call of the ego call of the desires call of various call of the relatives not to forget call of the ambition everybody everything pulling us in 101 directions so that time you have to keep confirming i'm here for this yoga i'm here for this yoga divine is the reason for my existence without him i don't exist whatever words it doesn't matter but once we have the call then there is this going through so again in every yoga when you have the call the second thing which is necessary is the guru the teacher of the yoga who is the teacher of this yoga so we have traditions where you have you know a living teacher who passes it on to other teachers this is not there in this yoga then we have you know traditions where you have the book the last teacher is gone and now that book becomes the teacher that is also not true this is only a part truth so then we have traditions where you have people who become perceptors so there is the guru and there are perceptors who go out and enroll people that is also not so in this yoga all these may be aids and help but the real teacher in this yoga is none else but the divine mother who is seated in the heart of every creature it means a tremendous leap of faith because we don't see the mother to start with of course we have a picture we know we read the life but we don't see with this human eyes and so it's but natural for people to ask but you know i'll give you an example someone said you know if you have a living guru you can talk to him and he will answer you he will tell you what to do and what you shouldn't do first of all shubhendra and the mother really indulged in that kind of do's and don'ts but more importantly if you talk to the mother and tell her she may not tell us what to do but she may do it for us it's an experience which requires a colossal faith and courage to go through and every time you go through you just marvel and wonder meaning thereby there is no one fixed way of this yoga that you ask the divine he tells us do this what can human beings do you know one of the first thing to realize is the tremendous limitations under which human consciousness labors the first starting point the mother says is that the mind should know that it cannot understand spiritual things <laughs> let alone lead us on the path because mind has a tendency to divide things into spiritual non spiritual the sacred and the profane the mundane and the supra mundane and it proceeds it helps the mind to orient that way for a moment but the divine doesn't work that we he is there in the least atom of existence he is there in the vastness of the sky he may you may accidentally trip over him when you trip over the you know slip over the grass i mean i actually had this experience of tripping over the rocks on the sea <laughs> sea shore <laughs> my first contact with the divine first contact means one of the most dynamic practical contacts with the divine was like that in this sea shore that time i had rocky Uh, those rocks i don't know now they have probably i don't know some places they have it so that shows the degree of ignorance now so sitting there and then climbing through the rocks i fell i fell and slipped because human beings fall nothing new about it <laughs> but it gave me the essence of yoga as i fell i experienced some unseen hands holding me actually it's not a joke and like a strobe my fall is being broken 
into bits and pieces, you know, strobe effect in dram drama we use. So I was just wondering if this is true. That means if you are destined to fall, divine will break it in nice way. <laughs> and when I fell, I felt so delightful, such a delight. Not as not only not as scratch, but I was feeling such. I was in bliss, lying on the rocks and. Maheshwari ji was accompanying me but he was on top. He suddenly saw a mundi coming up and then falling down and said, Alok! So I said, I am fine, don't worry. And I came up. <laughs> so, you know, th this was the contact that on the rocky um, pathways of the seashore, there was the divine waiting for me unexpectedly. Hidden round the corner, made me slip and then held me in his hand just to show how beautiful and gracious he is. <laughs> so this yoga is not like sitting in meditation and that time we have a contact with the divine. The beauty of this yoga is that the divine meets us in the most unexpected of manners. You sit in meditation, one hour nothing happens and every day you sit in meditation, nothing happens. The people who tell me, you know, kuch nahi hota. I said, kya kuch nahi hota hai? <laughs> I sit in meditation. How long you have been sitting? Four years. I said, what do you mean by kuch nahi hota? He said, meditation mein kuch nahi hota. Nothing happens in meditation. I said, yes, because you are not seeing where it is happening. <laughs> so, what do you mean? I said, because it is happening outside the meditation. You are all the time thinking what is going to happen in meditation. Are you are supposed to forget what is happening in meditation. Then it is meditation to start with. If you are still remembering who you are and what you are experiencing, the people who hear about samadhi, all kinds of things, and they come here and go away, saying, you know, I didn't experience anything. So I said, oh, you went there for an experience, that's why you blocked the avenues. Now you see, these are paradoxes. This yoga is about opening oneself wide and giving to the divine, and the joy of giving to the divine. I was reading today these lines from Savitri, where Satyavan and Savitri get married. But what a marriage with the divine is witness. And Shubhindu says that when a lover and beloved meet and forget themselves in each other, it is the experience is very similar to a soul meeting God. You know why? Because the primary condition is the same, the ego must dissolve. So in intense movement of love, the ego is gone. Unfortunately, human beings are experts at creating boundaries. So after some time, oh, no, 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 I shouldn't do that. I should use my rational mind. <laughs> Don't lose yourself. Don't be a fool. But with the divine, you lose yourself and discover that that's the wisest thing you ever did in life. Because what we call as secure limits, comfort zones are precisely what is the bar between us and the divine. These comfort zones are sometimes comfort zones of ideas. Comfort zones are not just material. What are the ideas? Oh, God is there. He'll take care of everything. He takes care of everything. But sometimes his taking care can be, you know, unless we have tremendous faith, as Shubhindu writes in one of his letters humorously, we are a community of just about six, seven people and I have just enough money which will take me through the dinner. I know that God provides, but he has contracted a bad habit of providing the last moment with all his sense of humor. So the primary requirement in this yoga is tremendous faith and courage. And it becomes very easy if you take it like, you know, a play, literally a play. When you have a play, it's like yoga is not an achievement. You're going to achieve, you're going to have this experience, comparing notes. So what experience you had, what experience you had. Did you see a light? Did you hear a sound? Just play with the divine. Be his child. And then... One is ready for the unexpected, for the joy of the unexpected. Let me put it like that. So, who is the guru of this yoga? She is the divine mother. What is the advantage? You don't have to just write to a human guru who will receive it and then reply. And most of the time, most human gurus will say, do meditation and you will get the answer. Which of course you know always. But for her, she doesn't go by whatever words are. She goes by what her consciousness is and corrects it. I have shared this experience some time back and maybe, you know, 30 years back, I was going through a kind of crisis. Okay, it's not that this is the only crisis I went in 30 years. A number of crises come in life and go. <laughs> but I wrote 30, 35 pages of letter to the mother, all describing my woes. And I was the good guy in that letter, mind you. 
and everybody else was the is complaining and all that and complaining in the sense that mother have tears flowing usual state you know i sent the letter well things got resolved everything happened but after many years i realized that my entire outlook toward that event was wrong now you see what did she do she didn't respond to the outer letter but because there was that basic cry within my being so she saw that my child doesn't understand anything about anything <laughs> let me do the course correction and how she did it i don't know it like it flashed to me over a period of time oh that's how now she became the counselor the mentor the healer in the truest sense what does a counselor do he substitutes for us temporarily the god whom we are who is within us he substitute he is meant to substitute but he cannot if he has fixed system psychoanalysis this system then he, he cannot play that role so this knowledge which the divine educes from within this is the real shastra so while there are two one is the shastra outside we must read it without a doubt try to make an effort to understand but what this shastra does what is this book meant to do called the synthesis of yoga or savitri the life divine it opens an inner door and then we discover that the inner veda opens up and then a kind of knowledge begins to reveal and unfold itself but what is the condition for doing it if we read with the hyper intellectual state with a dictionary by the side and with vedanta in left side of the head and or well ideologies in the left side of head vedanta on the right side and tantra in the center and trying to compare notes it won't work that's not how a shastra is read some people say oh shrivind has spoken of vedanta this vedanta in his yoga or there is tantra in his yoga so you can say both and none sometimes good to have paradoxes for the mind this is the only way why we want to brand and limit so when we read a book like savitri what it does read with the joy it's shrub in those words it is the words of the highest consciousness that has expressed itself upon earth now people may say oh you are already saying is the highest consciousness nowadays one has to be careful are you making a creed no sir but if you have a master if you want to follow a path then this is the need of the path one can't go to someone and say you know what tell me this much little bit i'll take it from here i'll take a little bit there well that's an approach but for yoga when we take to the yoga in shurvindo's yoga one has to learn to obey either the master within and till that is awakened the master outside and he has given us enough guidance more than enough there is really speaking no need to really ask anybody about anything except for laziness so it becomes a quick source of reference <laughs> or of course uh, there are some unique problems so what one should try open this inner door so that one is in contact with the mother within and one is in contact with the shastra within this is the first step of the yoga now contact with the mother within the path they have shown is very beautiful the mind cannot easily contact it will enter into endless mazes who is the mother why she is there is this this embodiment is it the same as world mother it will make you toss and turn and while the divine mother will sit and laugh and feel amused what is this child of mine doing i am right there and he is trying to analyze me so that's one path some people take they are intellectuals can't help it or rather they are not intellectuals because the if one is truly an intellectual one will understand this is the most foolish thing i am doing because if your mind could understand the divine then it's no more the divine the mind is god it's a very basic logic elementary logic but if the divine is greater than the mind then the only effort of the mind should be to open to that which is greater and turn toward that by kind of meditative concentration call it whatever but now here again when we talk about this meditative concentration there are two approaches we can take one is the exclusive concentration we pick up an idea and we start concentrating on that idea we can take for instance mother is within me and have that ma 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 seek inside seek doesn't matter which way divine has never been a respecter of rules and norms even when he seems to respect norms he uses norms to transcend them 
So while it is good, but always this seeking, it is this seeking which opens the door. Shurabindu calls it aspiration. This aspiration is like a fire. If the coat is very thick, for whatever reason, the fire takes long. So somebody will say, what can I do? The coat is very thick. Increase the fire. Still it doesn't dissolve. Increase the fire still more. As someone says, you know, I am I tried to love this person and you know it didn't work out. What should I do? So someone very rightly replied, increase the dose. So <laughs> so <laughs> increase the fire, increase the fire, increase the fire, increase the fire. Let it burn, become the fire. So this fire can increase by concentrating in the heart on this beautiful flame of aspiration, seeking the divine. Ma, 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 ma. Ma, I want you, I need you. And one day, persist. And one day the door opens. And how it opens, not like in which we are expecting, suddenly door will open, will be invaded by the light. Well, but before that, God gives plenty of glimpses. So you'll see somebody will come. He's a master of masters, king of kings. Hidden in his divine secrecies. He has to see that, are you really ready for the interview? So we are sitting and we have entered and where is the master of masters? So one fellow will come and ask, what do you want? I want to meet the master of masters. Why do you want? I have this problem, that problem. Okay, fine, I'll solve it for you. Are you the master? You can take it like that. So we are fooled. Meaning thereby, if we are seeking the divine for any ambition <laughs> or fulfillment of desire, all this will stand exposed. We may say, oh no, no, I am seeking the divine for the sake of the divine. But hidden behind, there may be a, I'll be a yogi. Nowadays, yogi is a big brand. huh? <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I love the, I love <laughs> Adityanath. But I'm just saying that yogi, call yourself yogi and suddenly you see people, people are so much carried away by appearances <laughs> that, you know, <laughs> you should appear like a yogi, you know. If you are dressed in a casual, smart dress, you can't be a yogi. These are all our conceptions. He drives in the rides in the car and drives in the chariot. He slays without stint and is full of compassion. He strikes in the spears. Look at Krishna. He is yogi, yogeshwara. It doesn't fit into any of our conventional ideas of a yogi. Why? Look at the mother. Shurabindo also, because you know, till he came to Pondicherry, by then he had realized all the greatest realization of yoga. He wanted to know what nirvana is. See that picture in Surat Congress, 1907. He is sitting and Tilak is standing. There is a fiery moment going on. Shurabindo is sitting with that calm. That calm, that peace comes. Is the sign that one is coming close to the divine presence. So when this angel has come and we say, no, no, sir. All that is okay. I want the Divine Mother. That's how Nachiketa Yama Samvad goes. So say, okay, then the Divine will send another agent. That is peace. Door will open and we'll feel so peaceful that we'll say, ah, I found it. You know, there's a Sufi sage who says, Mujhe be khudi ki tune badi chasani chatai. What a peace. And you start enjoying that peace. He say, why should they be need to do anything. <laughs> and the divine will say, Oh soul, it is too early to rejoice. <laughs> He'll throw us out of that peace. <laughs> because there are fields of nature. We, are, we may forget the whole thing. So he'll make sure. So aspiration one is to remember even in that state of peace. One should not take it as a finality. It's a tremendous experience. Some people start the yoga with this tremendous. Shivindu describes it like a ice block which enters, descends from above. And honestly, that experience can make you feel that this is the wonder of wonders. All that one has read about peace and you know, getting peace. I did meditation and I had peace. You will feel all that is so childish stuff. When you have the real thing, <laughs> peace, what it means. But yes, it will stay in the background henceforth as the basis. You always have that, but not to stop there. That's why Shubhindu says, my yoga begins, where are the yogas end? So you say, no, no, I have a work to do. I want to go further. So then the divine will send joy. 
Now that's very wonderful. All the time there is this state of inner felicity. You are right there by the side of the soul. The soul is emerging, peace and felicity. And one can stop there, but one has the aspiration. See this journey of aspiration. No mother, I want to serve you for lives, love you in everything, in the wicked and the vile, in the beautiful and the ugly. And then a time will come when will, she will lay her yoke, golden chain and the silver chain and the iron chain, call it whatever, and tie us to her. And then we are finished. <laughs> the story of yoga takes a different turn. After that, we don't do the yoga. <laughs> it tells somebody, uh, one of the worst questions to ask somebody, how are you doing the sadhana here? Somebody is, you know, very serious. And you don't know, <laughs> you know, the more you grow in yoga, you realize you don't do the sadhana. You have been actually creating a problem in the sadhana. The sadhana is done by the divine. And you tell the person, see, mother does the yoga in us. People feel you are holding a secret. See, sometimes the real secret you have given. But secret for yoga is like, no, no, he must be sitting in some kind of meditation. There is some secret mantra. So he will ask you, what is the mantra in this yoga? Just ma. Ma or mother? Or it's okay. Call ma, mother, amma, anything. She knows herself in the heart of the creature. You know, in a Sometimes children have this so spontaneously. In a class of children, uh, one child asked me, what language does the mother understand? So I said, what about you guys? You, you give me an answer. So one child says, Odia. I said, okay, why do you say so? She said, because every time I pray in Odia, I get an answer. I said, yes, but people pray in Tamil and get an answer. They play in English and there are... Dumb four-footed things. The tree, banyan tree, prays and gets an answer. We don't even know what that prayer is. It doesn't know how to speak. It goes to the mother, Ma, they are going to cut me. Save me. And the mother calls the fellow, You are planning to cut mother? How did you know? I had only thought about it. The tree came to me. The bird, the beast, the silent prayer. That is prayer. If we cannot aspire, pray. But prayer is not a book. From the prayer book, I do this particular prayer of the mother every day. Do it, it's good, wonderful, because you learn how to pray. But prayer is that which rises from the depths of the heart on a crest of emotion. That is prayer. And that brings a prayer, a master act, a king idea, can link man's strength to transcendent force. Then miracle is made the common role. So this one, going within and contacting her, but another is in the world contacting her. Everything at its bottom leads us to the divine. Look behind appearances of life, of the dumb stone, of the tree, and try to seek the divine. And one day there will be a disclosure. This is a very powerful meditation, by the way. One can try it while walking. That The divine mother in his embry is in everything. Some people say, I don't have time. But time is all the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> just remember her. You are sitting in an office space, remember her. You are talking to somebody. Inside, stay concentrated. And if somebody is very nasty, put her between the person and yourself. Trees, you are driving. And on while you are driving, at your own risk, okay? <laughs> stay concentrated on the mother. <laughs> It's a delight. It's an all-inclusive concentration. Doing an activity, cooking, stay concentrated on the mother. In the heart. It's such a joy. A cooking for a person who is going to come and eat and you're waiting. He'll appreciate your food. He is busy in his share market. No time for your food. And maybe if he appreciates, he will taste something so foolish. Like when I got married, I was supposed to, I was told, please appreciate the food. This is the culture you have to appreciate. So I didn't know, I forgot my usual thought. So I was given a nudge, you're supposed to say something. I said, yes, yes, the rice was very nice. And <laughs> plain rice, 
the only thing which didn't deserve an appreciation. <laughs> but when you cook with the idea that it's for the divine, then what is there? So, you know, in everything, weave the divine into life because he's already woven. It is just to be recognized. Then food becomes prasad. Life becomes a prayer. Walking becomes his yajna. And wherever we go becomes a tirth, a holy place. So to lead life in constant remembrance of the divine. As an offering to the divine. In everybody. <laughs> you know? And it, it makes you smile. Why it makes you smile? Because you realize that how foolishly we, <laughs> we live. Nobody taught us through the entire schooling process how to live. Why how to live? How to smile? We've forgotten. People ask, what do you get when you go to the ashram? What is the miracle? I tell them, one miracle, sure, for sure. What is it? What happened? You had some sickness and it got cured. I said, All that is minor thing. That's not really miracle. Doctors can do it. So what miracle happened? You were thinking you must get a house and it came up. Well, that also is happens here, but that's not a miracle. Any rich person can make a house. So what is the miracle? And I'm telling you it's a miracle to recover the lost habit of happiness. Try being happy. No way you can. You will learn all the ways, secrets, look at life this way, that way. <laughs> Everything is known, but you cannot. Why? Because happiness comes from that smile within. So, she teaches us, not teaches us, she gives us happiness in gift. In a haven of safety and splendid soft repose, one could drink life back in streams of honey fire. Recover the lost habit of happiness. From childhood as we grow, sorry to say, parents, teachers, society gives us house, advice, unwanted advice, huh? House, car, everything equips us for money, but it robs us of happiness, robs us of wonder. Why? Because, oh, I know it all. I have a degree, medical degree. You are going to tell me what a virus is? Yes, sir, because you don't know what a virus is. You just know a little structure and how it works. So when we can seek Him in all things, in every event, through everything. So there are two ways. One is to go within the narrow path. It's not that they are either or. But only go within the narrower path. This is what we keep hearing. The other is to expand into the vastness and in everything find the divine. In all your human relations, find the divine. Look here, she is smiling there. Behind someone whose face is very serious and telling you, you are the most miserable person on earth. Maybe the mother wants to tell you something. Take it. Somebody else who is showering endless praises. Oh, mother is feeling very amused. Look how this fellow is taking it. You know, when Udar Pinto came from American tour and people told him, Mother, he has become a guru. Is it? Call him. So Udar goes, What Udar? I heard he has become a guru. No, 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 mother. Sure, no? No, mother, no way. Good. Otherwise, I'll... Break your head, she put. <laughs> this is how yoga proceeds. It's a joyous journey because it's a journey to the all delightful. The sign that one is progressing in yoga is a growth of equanimity, peace, joy and that inner knowledge which flames. And if one is getting more serious, more tensed, more sad, then one is deviating from the path. This is the very simple one step criteria. If you can smile at life, at events and circumstances, why? Because she is there. And often I, this small little thing, you are walking with Divine Mother. I ask this one question. I have actually lived like that and feel so comfortable. Whether you are alone or in a crowd, doesn't matter. Just to know that she is with you. Will one ever be afraid or depressed? Doesn't matter if the world is taken away, you just look up, Ma, that's it, that's all that is required. And this is the practice of this yoga. 
to feel her, to remember her, to know that she is here with us all the time in this wonderful journey, to offer all our actions. But when we offer our actions, what does it mean? Doing it casually, indifferently? No. Imagine the mother tells us, make this little kerchief for me. Or make this salad, I want to eat it. How will you make the salad? Let's cut it just like that. There's a very interesting story about a sadhak who embroidered a kerchief and gave it to the mother. Mother looked at it and then she says, you know, this portion is so extraordinarily beautiful. And then the sadhak remembered that, and then she's smiling. That was the portion which he made in a state of inner remembrance. So all that we have to do is to constantly remember her in every activity, everything. That is one of the best and powerful meditations. To know that she is there with the eye of faith. And then to learn to wait. It's very important. Impatience is a sign of lack of trust in the divine. Divine doesn't deal with McDonald's and KFCs. He's not a Coca-Cola He's the ultimate cola. <laughs> he prepares good stuff, perfect stuff. Dhimi Achwali roti. Nicely he cooks a wonderful meal out of us so that he too can find it tasty and the world can say, yes, this is creation. So his creations are not like a hasty creations. We have to allow that time. What is he wanting to create in us? A divine humanity. Is it a joke? This physical being is all through. It responds to animality. It's very quick to respond to greed, anger, lust, fear. All these things come very naturally to the physical being. But the divine, after some time people, Kab khatam hoga? When will this lecture get over? How much life divine can I read in one hour? <laughs> because our brain cannot bear it. Our body cannot bear it. That's why we have to engage in what can be called as the tapasya of the integral yoga. What is tapasya of integral yoga? Again we have this idea. Oh, somebody's closed his eyes and if he is sitting in a white or whatever color, oh, he is doing tapasya, don't disturb him. You don't know the fellow is very disturbed inside. <laughs> he is trying to control himself. <laughs> That's not tapasya at all. Tapasya has nothing to do with a posture or gesture. What is tapasya? Tap, concentrate. To concentrate. Concentrate what? Energies. But if we don't have energy, why? How will we concentrate? If all the energies of my life, love, Seekings, knowledge, they are all the time scattered everywhere. How will we concentrate? There is nothing left to concentrate. So therefore conserve the energy. Don't gossip. Don't throw it out in all kinds of useless chatter. What is happening in Ukraine and Russia? Okay, God is there. He look after. It is good to be concerned. Fine. But don't add to his problem by forcing things. Third world war is around the corner. He is trying hard that, you know, human mind can free itself of this idea of third world. No, no, pakka, see, this is going to happen. And the people want it. Just hold on. Leave it to him. It's too big a cosmic problem. There is a problem which is manageable still. Manage it. The Russia and Ukraine within us. Two fellows fighting. Destroying each other. So try to harmonize the being. And that is only possible when... We do this. What is tapasya? It's to integrate. It's to bring things together. So that in everything, the divine becomes the single occupation. Now this single occupation doesn't mean all the time that I am, no, I am not speaking to anyone, meeting anyone. No, in every meeting, in every encounter with life, thousands of encounters, the attitude should be to discover the divine inside, to serve the divine, to love the divine, to know the divine. And then all discloses the unseen beloved. So to live with this idea of the divine, to be so occupied with this idea, to wake up and sleep with this idea, 
and if you do that they said an inner door opens we discover something very interesting the most important discovery the supreme discovery as the mother puts it that all this while we thought i am my name my surname my qualification my degree my job my occupation my parents my country my language my custom my tradition all this time i thought i am my thoughts <laughs> i thought i am my feelings and my willings all none of this is me this body and this is not a you know the in the traditional gyan yoga you say i am not this not this don't do that concentrate on who we are shubhendra yoga it's instead of saying i am not this not this instead of thinking oh the past some people say oh, but i am very burdened by the past the only way to get it is to move towards the future concentrate upon what i want to be and not what i was and even what i am in the present formation all this is there as a part of my personality but i am none of these and when one identifies the soul separates from the field of nature then one knows oneself it's a marvelous discovery and everything can become a fuel to go towards that if one is let's say alone in life for whatever reason then to say ah what a joy i can seek him i have time to be with my beloved and if one is in a crowd then one would say good too many people i can quietly just think of you if one is engaged and absorbed in an activity where are you i want you to be with me i may forget you you do you make sure that i remember you so many ways countless ways there are plenty of ways we should not fix one way and we can deal with the divine as a father mother friend lover master teacher any which way all relations are valid in the yoga and then this whole thing after we have discovered it our field of nature must become must be tuned so that it becomes a fit instrument and vehicle that's another tapasya if the mind has to become an instrument of the divine is it must particularly speech we must learn the concentration of speech we should not let any you see speech and mind they are very closely connected speech thought mind so tangible element is speech it's very tangible not to let this speech be driven by all kinds of impulses especially impulses of ill will hurting harming somebody falsehoods which are projected by the speech but instead to learn to be concentrated in speech and in thoughts every time the thoughts are running in that direction this direction to catch them and bring them back this is the tapasya tapasya of the heart to love people unconditionally not just people there is this whole creation but for ourselves to reserve all our expectations only from the divine then one is hurt proof but not necessarily that others may not get hurt from such a person that's destiny because you are taking to a root a path but for yourself you know that it's the divine from whom you draw sustenance and if you have reserved all our love to the divine then with others to have a constant goodwill even somebody who is trying to whatever way speak ill of you or something have this good will because every ill will is to obstruct the divine work in the world good will is the way we participate in the divine work why because in every human being the work is going on and everybody is what is it called project is under some are under maintenance some are under repair some are unfinished products some are where product thought it is finished but the portion was chipping off sent back to the mint so all this is going on in every one not to judge condemn and all these things but to observe all this with a calm smile in a state of equanimity and then if we do that the heart begins to become a vessel of the divine love vastness very important mother spoke of wideness and plasticity wideness not to be narrow thought 
narrowness is through dogmas, fixed dogma. Oh, he is a non-vegetarian. He is deviated from the path. Oh, he went, went to the some place. Oh, he is deviated from the path. When we are seeing all this, our stated like that man who was a sadhu seemingly and sitting in front of a woman who, well, was entertaining different men on different days. And he would say, chi, 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 what kind of woman, horrible woman. She will surely go to hell. And then he will watch who is the next man going. And <laughs> both died. And the, the, the sadhu goes there and he feels he will get a royal welcome. But meanwhile, this woman also comes. So he says, okay, take her first. And he says, you will have to go to heaven. He says, something is wrong. He waits for his turn. He is curious. When he goes, he says, well, hell and heaven don't exist that way. But anyways, he goes and says, what about me? If she has gone to heaven, I would go to the seventh heaven. Sorry, you have to go to have a sojourn in hell. What? You know what? You were all the time thinking of her deeds. Your imagined real and unreal misdeeds. So you were in your mind in an atmosphere of hell. Some people get a perverse enjoyment in thinking of deeds that others are doing which they disapprove of and which unfortunately or fortunately they can't do. So it's going on in the mind, you know. And the woman said, okay, what about the woman? Every time she slept with a man, she said, what is this life, Lord? But I can't help it. I have to earn money. You be the man. Every man was him. She said, what can we do? This is the way it is marked here. We don't go by what is visible to the mortal eyes. We go by what is unseen by the mortal eyes. The attitude, so important in this yoga. See, mother's twelve attitudes. Goodness, goodwill, kindness, perseverance, patience, aspiration, courage. This is the attitude we must cultivate. This is just one or two I have touched. But most important attitude, she says, is sincerity. Sincerity is a three-step process. One is mental honesty, not to deceive oneself. What you tell others is a different story, but don't tell yourself a lie. You know what? I'm the best guy in the world, everybody. So this is basic. This one doesn't have to do yoga to understand it. See things as they are inside. Second is, tell the divine as you see things, but always ask that may you see better, understand better, grow better, have a better will. And the third is when everything wants to align only to the divine. So that what we will is what the divine wills. Or what the divine wills becomes our will. So this way we do engage in the tapasya of works, tapasya of will, tapasya of life. Where every moment of life is turned into a prayer and a worship. And finally tapasya of the body. So he speaks about it. The body should not be driven either by mental concepts or by their vital greed desires. It will come again and again. But to give to the body the right amount of nutrition, health, exercise, enough rest, basic things. And most importantly, engage this body in some work for the divine. And if there is no work, apparently, there is always work. Every work can be turned into service of the divine. There is a work which we can turn into service of the divine by attitude. And there is a work given by the divine. But it doesn't matter either which way. But one of the simplest ways to engage the body in tapasya is read Sri and write. Or the mother. Read, read it aloud and write. See, different parts of body are engaged. The eyes, the brain, the hearing the nervous system, the hands. So this way, slowly, by serving the divine, the body engages in a kind of tapasya. So this is how the yoga proceeds on a very vast landscape. But this doesn't, all this touches only a fringe. 
the real journey begins or rather the real challenge of yoga is when one begins to enter into deep seated resistances of human nature in the beginning the journey is very smooth because well one is not encountering parts within us which resist that divine they do resist and how they resist by revolting by disobeying by going their own way independent way and it's a very very long pains taking process mother says you have to treat the recalcitrant parts as you would to children you know those who have children will understand or those who have old parents will understand what is to be done it's so difficult wants to keep telling and this each one has his own point of resistance the mother used the word shadow don't see other shadow huh? because it's so easy to see look at that man it may not be your difficulty yes but you have your own difficulty each one has his own unique difficulty and just look at that and how to work upon it one process is rejection mother said offer it look at this difficulty every time it comes up ma take it ma change it. it's a very very painstaking process because the deep suited resistances minor resistance will just drop off minor resistance i mean smoking drinking eating non veg all these things people think are very big things no deep seated resistances can be many and ambition deep seated resistance sexual hypersexuality deep seated resistance greed inordinate greed and most of all fear they don't go just like that so keep offering it and little 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 keep putting the will keep putting illumination this not what i am here for then eventually they become thin and thin and then they go away when they go away then the being is really ready for the transformation this is the broad landscape of yoga i would like to stop here and he said it's a very long tremendous beautiful journey people find it difficult when they walk without the divine now we may find it strange because we may not really trust that the divine is walking with us we may believe that no no all is my own effort divine is okay when you need me tell me till then i am resting and relaxing you know he loves to little bit back seat retiring predispositions should be the use the word okay go ahead bacha tell me said lord this oh yes you remember i am there and delightful when you are conscious that the divine walks with you holding your hand carrying you in his lap her lap through all the trials and tribulations of the journey so central secret is this opening to the divine mother surrender to the divine mother surrender also is a three step process first is central surrender i am yours keep reminding till one day is okay i know you are mine i am yours i am yours take my destiny mold it the way you want but then afterwards don't say i told you to take my destiny but you know what i thought things will be goody goody say so, oh, come on i don't work like that <laughs> i have taken your destiny <laughs> i'll work in my own way so surrender center surrender from today my destiny is yours and this today should go every day not like one day i told and that's the end of the story ma take me i want to belong only to you and then this surrender must start entering into different parts of a being not only my destiny every part ma take this mind make it your channel for your luminous forces to pour through word and speech and everything else ma take this heart surrender the heart make it a beautiful a chalice for thy wine of ananda of pure love for thy sweetness to pour upon earth I take this life, turn it into an engine for thy works. I take this body, transmute it into a vessel and a vehicle to bear thee in this great journey. And then the third stage of surrender is 
when in every detail of life one gives to the divine and this surrender should go on till one reaches that point that one has completely given oneself to the divine there is nothing which is kept for oneself nothing for myself for my pleasure my joy what will happen to me doesn't matter all for the divine my life for the divine work for the divine when that stage comes then one is done what one is meant to do beyond that let the divine like the master magician do what he will with us and all that we will keep saying is let thy will be done let thy will be done let thy will be done okay namaste we can have some questions Yeah, Nidhi, you can go ahead, unmute and ask. Uh, Pranam, Alokda, thank you for being here for us and enlightening uh, path. So my question is, just elaborate a little bit more on the second stage of surrender for the different parts of the being. So uh, thank you. Yes. thank you it can be done surrendering the different parts of a being so as i said first is a central surrender the second part is the surrender of our character there is a way with which we are identified we act and react and we think it is very natural and we justify it so we think in a certain way and we think well that's how things are we have our opinions view points so all these things we must understand are not truth not even aspects of truth but they are all gathered from various uh, cosmic or social ideas ideas so we have to learn to strip ourselves and see that all these are nothing but prevalent and customary ways of looking at it then one surrenders the mind when one has reached that point and says mother i really don't know the truth but i want to be your channel your instrument pour so that every time one has to speak may my speech express your truth your beauty your love your light so through this aspiration the mind begins to slowly get oriented so it involves two movements one is the rejection of that which one knows is now an inferior movement and an opening to that which is the higher movement to put it in a you know yogic parlance so the inferior movement is customary ideas opinions view points gathered from books people circumstances of birth society etc 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 the superior movement is only what the divine truth is which i don't know the mind cannot conceive but it opens to it and then this truth begins to pour in as inspiration revelation intuition i'm summarizing a long process but that's how it is same with the heart there is an inferior movement selfishness narrowness what am i getting out of this love that i am giving to someone what is my gain this is not to say one should become a martyr certainly not we are not here to please people but to please the divine but the superior movement of love is that it is a master it is over the movement and not a you know it's not dragged into the uh, quagmire of sadness and depression every time it gets hurt rather it should keep on learning how to give but not give to a person but to the divine presence in that person and then one is free that movement becomes freed from all these attachments all these attachments which are due to expectations they seem natural yes they are natural at a point of time my father my mother my husband my wife to say the last that should be the last thing huh? they never fulfill like that people believe and no no my child when he grows up he'll fulfill my wishes he'll go bye bye tata he may or may not huh? if he is meant to give us a right lesson he will go away he will not why should he he should find his own destiny so to understand this basic thing that nobody is here to fulfill my expectations to satisfy me that's not empowerment that's a slavery why should i seek a joy or love from somebody else no 
I should find it within me and rather I should be giver. But I cannot be a giver till I have opened to the source of infinite love. So love the divine in one word. <laughs> and if we cannot love the divine, know that the divine loves you. That's fair enough. That the divine loves you. And see, it will begin to make the magic. Every time you are hurt, people, oh, so and so turned out to say, mother loves me. That's it. Oh, let me love the mother. She alone is worth loving. So this way the heart enters into a superior movement. Same with life. This is the surrender to the mother. My love, the energy of love, which I was throwing here and there, surrendering to 100 people. Now I put it at your feet. I want to love you. Give me true devotion. Give me unflinching faith in you. Give me a devotion that never gets tarnished. Rather it grows more and more luminous through all the trials and tribulations of life. I remember reading a story in childhood. You know, you must have heard about Dhruva. And Dhruva is known to be a great tapasvi. And people take Dhruva tapasya means he's sitting with all this rain, all this. That's just the outer thing we see. Why? Because when the Lord appears before Dhruva and says, ask anything. So he says, give me akhand avichal bhakti in your feet. That's all he asks. Now when I read this story, I said, my God, so much he did to ask only this. Now I understand. This is the only thing worth asking. Akhand, unbroken, continuous, avichal, that which never gets shaken by anything. Bhakti for you. Ask for bhakti, ask for love, for the divine. Then, of course, as I said, life, we'll see how it is engaged in hundred. Even when it claims to do mother's work, it is still eyeing on praise. It is still eyeing on hundred things. Not to speak of when we are leading life normally in the world. But to do it completely, Ma, through this work, it may be big or small in the world's eye. No more now. I want to serve you. Take this work as yours. Make my life strong and Powerful enough to serve you. I am weak in my body. I am weak in my life. If one is, make this body and life your pure and perfect channels. This is a very beautiful poem of Sri Surrender. Where it talks about this in detail. That how mind, heart, bodily life, all existence. So we have to do it in detail, step by step. And then every movement, every activity. Whether it be prescribing a drug, I mean, I'm talking as a doctor, going and taking a class, sitting on the counter, distributing food, eating, everything should turn into a sacrament. That is the detailed surrender. These are the three steps. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Subhashri, you can unmute and ask. Uh, namaste, Alukta. Um, so in the under sincerity, you mentioned about how we align our will with the divine will. So one thing I've always wondered is how to identify, suppose we understand that that is the divine will and what are the steps that we take uh, in our daily life to ensure that we always have that alignment? So how to align ourselves with the divine will and sincerity? They are closely allied, but there is a very subtle difference. So let's put it first, how to align with the divine will. First, one should get rid of all preferences and desires, which itself is not easy. So the better way to proceed step by step is Nishkam Karma of the Gita. Do your work. It's your work. Do it your way and naturally. But do it without eyeing the result. This itself is a very big step. Very powerful step, very liberating step. If you get something, take it as a gift of grace. If you don't get anything, take it also as a gift of grace. Be grateful for all that comes, life gives us. But do the works only for the joy of working in the spirit of service to the divine. If one does that, over a period of time, one begins to get rid of preferences and desires. Because why we prefer a particular work? Because something we are going to get. Why we cherish a certain kind of work? Because the desire self tells us. These are the things. So, to get rid of preferences and desires. Preferences again are stem from the ego. This work is worthy of, you know, um, 
me this work is low work so all this should go away meaning they buy all work at home we have hundred of things we do anyways so all this should be done with the idea that it is the divine work and done as a service then with that one should practice a growing inner peace and equanimity equanimity when weather is not good or weather is too good even too good weather oh today is such a lovely weather let's go out Lovely weather, you can be quite happy. <laughs> oh, it's a horrible weather, my God. Pondicherry, how much is the weather? How much is the, you know, temperature, humidity? And people discuss. Come out of that. Praise, blame, guilt, all these shocks of life. Contrary opinions, ideas, people hold. So practice of equanimity is a fundamental practice to yoga. And when we have done all this, then the divine will begins to emerge as a kind of indication, as the psychic being emerges. But till then, we should take two attitudes. One is, whatever we do, we should try to think of three things. One is truth, second is beauty, and the third is good. Align at least with the truth, truth of our own being. It's not about truth as the world knows or sees it. Truth of our own being. Be true to that. And second is beauty. And the third is it should bring out the best. Why only could. And then the third step is that we may not always know what is the divine will or what is the best way to do things. But when we have taken the yoga, we want to unite with the divine. At least this much we will know that this activity is creating in me a kind of veil. It is throwing up muck. It is creating uh, you know, a state of agitation, excitement, depression, which is putting me into a hole. Meaning thereby there are things which come between me and the goal that I have chosen. So we must very carefully identify these elements and cast them away. It's not just about I am depressed. It's to look why I am depressed. Because there is a false movement, an egoistic movement, a wrong movement. And I must try to eliminate that movement. That is sincerity. So we see that they are very elite. Sincerity means to be transparent before the divine. To see things as they are, not to just give a justification all the time. And then the basic thing about sincerity is that any movement should help us come closer to the divine. And if it is taking us away from the divine, then we should discard that movement or realign it if you cannot discard realign keep realigning till it becomes in tune with the goal that we are pursuing that's how sincerity is developed ultimately sincerity is uplifting all the movements of which our being is capable and organizing it around the highest ideal we have conceived the high, highest ideal may be serving the divine loving the divine so in every movement must become a service of the divine Every movement must become a love and adoration of the divine. So that way we keep uplifting all these movements and slowly they become more and more sincere. When they are sincere, it automatically gets aligned. But it becomes very easy if the psychic being is brought out. So first step should be to bring out the psychic being. It's very difficult to do all these things with the mind because the mind can easily swing views. It can, uh, you know, <laughs> give a very suitable and neat justification. So... Keep concentrating in the heart to find the soul within, the divine presence within. At the same time, keep practicing nishkam karma and equanimity, dedicating all we do to the divine. This is the simpler and uh, in a sense this is the way to remember and offer. Remember the divine and keep offering everything. Vishal, you want to ask a question? Yeah. Namaste. Uh, you mentioned that nobody is there here to fulfill our expectations and that attachment is the cause of misery. Uh, but my question is, if one is already attached or entangled or uh, in such a relationship or something, how do we actually bring ourselves out of it, extricate ourselves out of it? That was my question. How to actually do it in a very practical and... Uh... Yeah. 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 
So the practical way is, see, if there are two ways of doing it. One is you cut the attachment, but it's very difficult, you know, and it brings pain as a backlash and it's never good to uh, take the journey by bringing pain and suffering to everyone. But it can always be turned into a mint of love. So turn attachment into love, give love, goodwill unconditionally. At the same time, for our own, you know, uh, our own, uh, I won't use the word quota of love, but our need of love, turn to the divine. So when we do that, we'll actually be able to make this relationship more beautiful. Because other person may expect from you, but at least you are not expecting anything. Because you are getting your expectations fulfilled from the divine. At the same time, there is a another kind of loop in which one may get caught. And that loop, I mean, I know it by practical experience you may end up saying okay i don't have any expectation but i must fulfill the other person's expectations so that's where one has to remember that the line can be very thin so yes we must love unconditionally be full of goodwill continue to do give love help be full of goodwill everything but the moment you feel that this is now entering into the quicksand where attachment is becoming a tool to drag you into a quagmire. Gently, there are two ways of doing surgery. One is butchery, snapping it. Another is a fine, delicate surgery where you slowly tweak it and come out of that kind of entanglement. So you keep the love intact. Don't expect from the person. Expect from the divine. But as far as the person's expectations are concerned, be careful that this expectation doesn't lead to what we can call in Indian, dharma, Indian thought as a dharma, meaning thereby taking you away from your own true law and way of being. That is what one should be careful of. But if you turn to the divine, you will see that you will get so much abundant that human love will look very insipid. It like, you know, you feel you will feel stifled, not comfortable because one has turned to the divine. So turn this energy of love to the divine. You don't have to break from the person. That's what I mean. You have to just keep changing that attachment into mint of love. Mother was asked this question. What should we do if human love comes our way? She says, I mean, it's like turn it into a yoga by uh, loving the person without any expectation, selflessly, with utmost goodwill, that's the path. Of course, there may come a point where the person is misusing this and begins to, you know, uh, as I said, use your goodwill to finish your own journey. Then you have to probably come out. But if one is strong enough, one doesn't need to come out. One can just keep offering to the divine and stay with the divine. Do your work, which is not just about a relationship. Relationship is one aspect of life. There is a much greater work that one is here to do. So concentrate on that, inner growth. That's the gentler path. Chetna, you want to ask? Thank you, Alokda, for the wonderful session. And uh, I have two, three questions. Uh, the first one is, actually, Whatever question I have, you have already answered it. And then there is another layer. So, uh, so with regards to equanimity, I uh, often find myself getting hurt or, you know, getting unbalanced uh, by opinion of others. Like, um, even if I know the truth and uh, sometimes I recognize that it is a projection of the other person and uh, yet you can't always say it. So, yeah. You know what? Um, can I answer this? Because today only. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> you know what? Sometimes it's good to be recognized as a villain. <laughs> And you don't have to prove yourself and always try to be, you know, I am a good guy. No, why not? Okay, just say that, okay, in your eyes, I am a bad guy. That's it. That's the end of the journey. Then you will be relieved. The other person will be relieved. 
you won't be hurt anymore the other person will feel justified what does it matter god knows who you are so <laughs> sometimes the easiest way i am telling you from practical experience yeah 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 <laughs> accept it okay fine yes <laughs> you will you will be happy the other person will be happy and you will know that whatever i am or i am not it is she who is there to you know take care yes. sometimes good because to maintain a good thing and based on human standards to start with is a near impossibility <laughs> don't try it <laughs> otherwise you'll be, you'll be vulnerable to many hurts so take it that's okay fine <laughs> i am this person that's it <laughs> yeah thank you thank you yes thank you my second question is about aspiration uh how to develop the true aspiration sometimes one also wonders what is really worth aspiring for yes that's the important part to give a concrete form to the aspiration because aspiration remains otherwise vague yes divine means what so that's why aspiration should be given a form by form i mean why am i seeking the divine so it could be i want to serve the divine now that becomes a concrete aspiration i want to love the divine in the true way that becomes a concrete aspiration i want to become a channel or instrument of the divine now that's an aspiration i want to unite with the divine perfect aspiration i want to you know in many fold ways relate to the divine in all the vastness in every way so give form to the aspiration and that form has to emerge from each one within when you give a form to the aspiration it become very easy otherwise it becomes nebulous like a flame inside some people say concentrate on the flame well that's you know you have to give it a that's what mother has said give it a concrete form and the concrete form in yoga is uniting with the divine serving the divine loving the divine no one can aspire for knowledge aspiration for light for wideness for peace give it a form and there is no need to have one form there will be one core form and then it can take different shades at different points of time for example okay. yeah. uh, my uh, on the first day during uh, silence i realized like my intention for this course is to know what is my core aspiration and uh, right and to center my life around it because i feel like at times you know i've tried many things and uh, i to know my core aspiration so is there yeah so it will emerge it will emerge obviously course talks reading they are help but allow it time one day it will emerge keep ask you ask the divine that tell me what is my core aspiration or give me aspiration then one day it will emerge automatically you will see that it begins to take shape and form trust the divine and pray to the divine to give you aspiration and show you what do you really aspire for yes okay so shall we there's one question i looked at from vishal maybe you can close with that oh. yes what is i looked at sorry to come again uh, you uh, you mentioned no, that no, no, to no. get away with that attachment is to turn the energy towards the divine to seek that love from the divine now this may sound a very yes. mundane or a silly question my thing is how to actually bring that about that 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 transformation or that shift yes yes i understand that think of the divine you have seen human love isn't it and what it stands for and therefore knowing this with this knowledge turn to the divine in whatever way you can conceive like okay i want you i want to understand you i want to love you think of the divine whatever way or make this movement of heart every time it is hurt every time it is pulled by strings of attachment turn this energy to the divine knowing that he alone is the one worthy of all love or you can do a third kind of thing and that is um, if one can do it that's also very beautiful that 
one loves somebody in a certain way aspire pray seek that may my love grow beautiful and true so this way what happens the divine flows into the energy of love instead of presently it is full of attachments full of you know suffering and swings between happy moments and then the sad moments so instead of that you pray to the divine that may my love uh, this is something which uh, i have uh, you know myself seen that you pray whomever you are attached to may my love become true and beautiful just have this prayer and you see how things will change thank you so much alok that's always a delight to be in your presence and you gave us such practical ways to connect with the mother and thank you thank you so much if there are more questions we'll consolidate them and give it to you and you can take your time to you know, reply to them yeah thanks a lot alok yes please thank please do that yes yes thank you